Good afternoon, everyone. It is my uh, great pleasure to uh, moderate this very uh, interesting session uh, on the global growth market outlook. And after uh, uh, the 10 years of the uh, financial crisis, and IMF finally uh, stopped downgrading the, uh, the forecast for the global economy and also for the emerging market. And so uh, broadly, uh, the prospect for the emerging market and global growth market uh, uh, seems to be very positive, but still, uh, the uh, uh, situation in the different uh, countries remain uh, uh, diverse quite a lot, and also the facing the uh, daunting uncertainty down the road. So, will they see a, grow, a global growth market sustain their momentum in 2017 and beyond? Will be the core question we're going to answer in the in this session. So, we have a great panel today, and uh, before we start the uh, discussion and debate, we're going to uh, watch a very short video. Our colleague will help. The IMF has estimated that economic growth in emerging markets and developing economies would rise to 4.6% in 2017 from 4.2% in 2016. However, the capital outflow floodgates from emerging markets has opened widely. According to IIF, in 2016, the net non-resident capital inflow into emerging markets hit a new low since 2008 of 28 billion US dollars, a 90% decline from the average level between 2010 and 2014. In 2017, will the global economy continue to recover while embracing unprecedented uncertainty? Where will black swans be gathering? Where are the dark horses in global growth markets? Coming up next, Eatsai Media Group joins guests of the World Economic Forum to discuss global growth markets outlook. You are watching CBN Forum. Great, welcome back. So uh, we have a great panel uh, today, and uh, uh, to my uh, left, uh, Pravin Gauten, the Minister of the Finance of uh, uh, South Africa. And uh, uh, next to him, um, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Asani, uh, uh, Asani uh, Bachelors. Uh, she is the founder and the chief executive office officer of the Rock Greek Group of United States. And uh, uh, next to her, uh, Professor Liu Ming Kang, he is the uh, Distinguished Research Fellow in the Institute of the Global Economics of Finance, and also he's a former uh, president of the CBRC in China, so he's a real expert on China and emerging market. And next to him, uh, Mr. Arif M. Uh, Nayuvi, he's the founder and group chief execu uh, executive of the Abira Group uh, of the United Arab Emigrants. And also, uh, the, the last but not least, uh, um, professor Carmen Reinhardt, and he is the, uh, a very famous professor in the uh, international economics and also in the uh, emerging markets. We all know the uh, very famous book, This Time is Different. So uh, yeah, we have a, a great panel uh, today, and we are trying to uh, answer the uh, a very uh, difficult question about the future of the uh, global growth market. When we talk about, about global growth market, and we uh, refer to emerging market, developing countries, and maybe sometime uh, uh, frontier economies, and maybe some uh, uh, low-income countries, but mainly we will uh, refer to the emerging market and the uh, developing countries. So uh, before we start the, uh, um, the questions for the specific countries, I would like to ask you an overview question about your uh, overall assessment for the uh, global growth market, a ranking from 1 to 10. Uh, 1 means a very, very low growth, but very high risk. And 10 means a, a very high growth, but very low risk. So uh, maybe you can uh, give us the uh, uh, overall assessment for the uh, uh, global growth market. So um, the minister? I'm an, uh, I'm an optimist by nature, so six and a half. Six and a half, very high. <laughs> and Asani? I'm pretty close, I like seven. Good, very good. And uh, uh, Professor Liu? Six. Six, a little lower. And the, uh, 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 Arif? So I'll combine both of them and go to seven and a half. <laughs> <laughs> seven and a half. And Carmen? <clears throat> well, let me first put in perspective uh, 2010, 2011, with a boom in commodity prices and low interest rates, lots of capital inflows. That was not a quite a 10, but close to a 10. 
Uh, then in 2015, with commodity prices collapsing, the prospects of rising U.S. rates, China slowing down, uh, moved closer not to a one, but maybe a three. So I'm going to concur with the majority uh, and say somewhere between six and seven. A little, little less than a bullion than you, but... Well. Yeah, and six and seven, I think it's a, a quite remarkable number for the uh, global growth market. Uh, but the, uh, I think a lot of the uncertainty uh, weighing on, on the uh, growth in the global growth market. So one important thing is the, uh, what will be the, the Fed's next move in 2017. So uh, uh, Asani and Carmen, you are a real expert on the uh, uh, um, uh, United States the, uh, financial markets experts. So what is your view on the, uh, uh, the Fed's move in 2017? Do you think how many uh, the hikes will Fed is going to have? Uh, above more than three? times or a, a less than three times, so common? I'm inclined to the less than three. Uh, for the following, there's two important domestic reasons <coughs> why I think the rise in rates is gonna be very gradual and one international one. I think on the domestic side, um, a much more <laughs> aggressive move than that would really drive the dollar higher still and I think that would be a concern for what it would do to the current account, what it would do to growth, and it would be a drag in the U.S. Secondly, one can't forget that the U.S. is highly indebted, uh, public and private debt, and interest rate hikes uh, are not the best friend uh, of high debt. And uh, third, I think that the uh, global arena is one in which uh, countries, uh, well, central banks in Europe, uh, the ECB, the Bank of England, uh, Bank of Japan, the People's Bank of China, are on easing mode. Uh, and I think that will also have uh, some effect on having the rate normalization be more gradualist. Yeah, thank you. And Asani, what is your view uh, on My that? view is that the Fed will probably increase every quarter. So that means really three moves this year. Um, the reason for that is that labor markets have started tightening quite a bit in certain areas. So while in the US, while we have had um, sort of a slow growth in employment earlier on, now that we are seeing employment in certain areas get very hot in certain markets and certain regions in the US, there's already um, some impact in terms of uh, wage inflation in, in those areas. Now, of course, there's huge disparity because we also see underemployment and unemployment in certain other areas. But I think overall, when the Fed looks at things, um, my sense is that Mrs. Yellen uh, will most likely start feeling that uh, it's, there's more likelihood of an upside risk yeah. to a downside risk. The other thing is that with the potential um, policies that uh, President-elect Trump has been talking about, again, there is a greater upside risk in terms of interest rates going up because if we have the infrastructure, if we have the tax changes, if we have the growth uh, impact of the policies, again, um, another reason for, uh, for interest rates to go up faster. So that's where I would put my money. Yeah, uh, Professor Liu Mingkang, you also have yeah, been there, it, I guess. It depends on how heavy the checks and balances facing Trump in implementation of his initiatives. Uh, definitely the U.S. economy may actually uh, run hot into this year. And uh, so if that happens, less checks and balances in the Congress and uh, in many other organizations, then we, what we can see that Fed automatically will give at least three times 25 basis points. It's a <coughs> small step each time, 25, 25, 25. If we face a lot of checks and balances saying that the current existing debt level is very high 
And if you want to have the deficit like six trillion US dollars in 10 years, that means six billion US dollars every year, then it could be ridiculous. So if he faces more checks and balances in fiscal policy, implementing deficits and the infrastructure and so on and so forth, I think two times, twice this year will be witnessed. But anyway, the Fed two or three times 25 basis points for rate hike will not go into change the dynamics. The US economy will definitely be reaching 2% plus growth this year. Yeah, I think that is associated with the monetary policy back to the uh, normalization uh, in, in the United States. Another uh, a very big issue is the, uh, the dollar. Actually, uh, the dollar has appreciated in the real uh, effective terms uh, since the last August is a six percent, and the, uh, since the financial crisis, actually, the dollar has appreciated about forty percent. And the, uh, uh, the Professor Reinhardt uh, common uh, told us that the uh, uh, history taught us that every time when the uh, dollar uh, started appreciating journey, there's going to be some crisis in other places like in the Latin America and in Asia. So uh, will this time different? How will uh, the emerging market and global growth market be affected, impacted by the, uh, the rising dollar? Uh, common? I think there is a lot of variation depending on whether you have a lot of dollar debt or not. And yeah. so one of the challenges in many emerging markets has been that corporates have taken on in recent years, while taking advantage of the low interest rate environment, taken on uh, much more dollar debt than we had seen uh, up through uh, the global financial crises and some years uh, afterwards. So for those countries, uh, a strong dollar is not good news. For countries that are tied to the dollar, say some of the oil producing countries where uh, the desire is also to diversify the economy. Um, being tied to an appreciating dollar is not conducive. So uh, the net effect of the dollar strength, I would not say it's uniform across the board. Many Asian countries that do not have a lot of dollar debt uh, would benefit from having a more competitive uh, currency, so the trade channel uh, is stronger. But um, it it does, as I said, put place those countries that have you know current account deficits that have lots of dollar debt uh, at particular risk. Yeah, and the uh, Asani. I was just going to add. I completely agree uh, with Professor Reinhardt. I think the only thing that I would add is that there is sort of the short-term impact and the longer-term impact, because I think we're at early stages in terms of the interest rate hikes, and yeah. we could be in a situation where interest rates could get um, out of hand and go up a lot more beyond 2017. And in that case, I think the impact on emerging <coughs> markets could be a lot more. In the short run, I think even the countries that have amassed a lot of uh, dollar debt um, if you remember a little while back, they had to deal with this. And, um, and I think some, for some of them, again, um, they have built reserves. They've slightly improved their macro policies so that they would be better placed in the course of 2017. But I'm much more concerned beyond 2017. Yeah. Uh, Minister Goten, what is your view on that? I think the South Africa are uh, a little bit safe. A little bit safe, but I think what, what, what <laughs> I hope so. The U.S. is very big, and they say whenever it sneezes, the rest of us catch a cold. Uh, but I, I, on the one hand, there's, there's, if you like, the technical way of looking at things, which we have here heard. But I think in the U.S., you're going to have the complexity of uh, or contributed by the political economy as well. You have a Congress and an executive that has possibly a particular philosophical outlook, let's put it politely and a Fed that might have a slightly different philosophical outlook as, as well. And uh, how, how one calculates the balance between the two and the interaction between the two 
as we get into six months and 12 months after this Friday, uh, might have interesting implications for the discussion that we've just had. The second is that the 2013 taper tantrum certainly yeah. taught us the, about the interconnectedness of the emerging markets uh, and the United States, a lesson that hasn't been forgotten and one that we need to be very mindful of. If emerging markets and developing countries are the major contributors to growth, uh, globally speaking, what happens uh, in respect of growth in those countries uh, matters to the global environment as well. Absolutely. And uh, the Fed has shown, uh, I think in the last two, two and a half years, uh, a new kind of sensitivity to their decisions uh, having particular kinds of negative impacts on emerging markets as well. And that's a factor we hope that won't be lost uh, in the overall equation because U.S. decisions are not contained within the U.S. borders. They actually impact on the rest of the world and particularly on emerging markets as well. Over and above uh, dollar-denominated debt and so on. In the South African case, uh, we have a 10% limit for foreign currency debt and, and we okay in that sense. But there are a number of countries on the African continent who borrowed during the low interest environment and uh, then you had the drop in the commodity prices uh, which impacted upon their ability to repay uh, the debt and that began to have quite a negative impact uh, on the fiscal situation and they found themselves knocking at the doors of the World Bank or IMF and sometimes friendly developing countries in order to get uh, financial assistance of one kind or another. And I think that experience of the last 18 months or so uh, needs to be borne in mind uh, as we look at the interest rate issue as well. Yeah, thank you. And Arif, uh, you are going to talk about the emerging market and also at the same time the sub-Saharan countries. Finally. <laughs> So, Sorry? No, what I mean is that, you know, we've been talking about emerging markets almost like a puppet on a string kind of context. What will happen with the U.S. dollar and what will happen to our markets? The real reality is that we're talking about a large element of the world's population. And we're talking about a part of the world which, according to any estimate, whether it's the IMF, whether it's the World Bank, whether it's the big consultancies, two-thirds of the world's GDP growth is going to come from these markets in the course of the next 10, 12 years. Approximately a billion people are going to move into the middle classes in these markets in the course of the next 12, 13 years. And more importantly, close to 70% of the global consumer spend in the world is going to come from these markets. So when we talk about things like consumer spend and GDP, we have to remember that the largest corporations in the world operate in these markets as well. So whether you're talking about Unilever, Coca-Cola, Kimberly Clark, Colgate Palmolive, et cetera, and you disaggregate their income statements, you will find that the rate of growth in these markets for those companies is three to one compared to developed markets. So if you set that as the backdrop to our discussion, I'm a big believer in saying, you know, these broad statements like emerging markets are going to suffer because of interest rate hikes or X or Y or Z. I say, let's try and disaggregate this issue because you asked a great question at the outset. You said, how do you rate them one to 10? I only said seven and a half because I was embarrassed about getting more optimistic. Uh, <laughs> but I can break it down, right? Yeah. And I'll tell you how I'll break it down. Let's break down the emerging markets as you refer to them in four buckets. Let's take the first bucket is China. China is a law unto itself. And we saw the Chinese president give great comfort to the world's population this morning. And we saw that what China does, it's effectively an ecosystem that for the last decade has been reliant on industrial activity and investment infrastructure, and now is moving towards a consumption economy. It's not an easy task, but they've taken that investment structure and infrastructure growth, and through the One Belt, One Road, they've translated it into 100 countries around the world. So let's look at China in isolation. It is the largest if not the largest, the second largest economy in the world, and it's wrong to call it an emerging market. Then let's look to, at two other buckets together. The first is the countries that are commodity driven. These are directly linked to the US dollar yeah. because their commodity is priced in US dollar and it would be wrong to consider them as anything other than in the thrall of the US dollar, okay? Now, if you ask me about growth prospects there, I would say three, four, five, 
okay? Because that is not a clear story in terms of outcome. We have to be reliant on what's going to happen in commodity pricing and what's going to happen to alternative energy sources and the US dollar. So let's use them in a separate bucket. The third bucket that I would like you to think about is the consumption-driven economies. There's about 45, 50 countries around the world which are entirely driven by consumer spending, by consumer opportunity, by more and more people coming into the middle classes. These are countries where the rate of growth and the opportunity through better governance is very prevalent. These are the eight and nine end of the spectrum. So I don't think it's right to look at it as one enormous bucket. And then my fourth category that I really feel it's important for this audience to think about and focus on is cities. In our markets, cities are beginning to become arguably more important than countries. And cities are reaching out to other cities in other countries as a means of cross-collaboration. And you are beginning to see that as more and more people move into cities, it's affecting the rate of growth of economies as well. So you know that if Indonesia is growing at 4%, Jakarta is growing at 8%. If Istanbul is growing at 4%, then Turkey is definitely growing at, you know, so it's always double the rate of output and growth that the country is experiencing. That's what's driving the entire economy forward. So overall, I'm very optimistic about the prospects for emerging markets, global growth markets as we call them, in the course of the next uh, year certainly and in the next four or five years. It is driven by some very basic facts that you can't go away from. It is driven by the fact that consumption and infrastructure growth is happening there. Clean energy is becoming cheaper and cheaper. The biggest resource constraint is energy, and that's beginning to become more available. And where will be the, uh, the headwinds? You are very optimistic, but where will be the headwinds? So the headwinds are always there. You know, you, had, you, you were talking earlier while we were out there about the black swan, where will the black swan moment come from? I mean, the reality is we've proven over the last year, uh, whichever way you look at it, whether it's Brexit or the US presidential election, the black swan can come from anywhere now. Right? There is no country that is immune to the black swan moment, and there's no single uh, event that you can say will drive things into disruption. There are always risks that are inherent in these markets. Political risk is always a very important uh, issue. We are in a globalized world. Geopolitics is beginning to become more and more of a driver in the way opportunities either constrained or let loose. Uh, and uh, I think between currency, geopolitics, uh, and just a let's call it an uh, inherent uncertainty around what is going to happen in the US that is slowing stuff up. But the flip side of that, since you called me an optimist, the flip side of that is very definitely a very clear understanding that if the US imposes trade barriers, if the US goes towards protectionism, it is going to lead to a rise in South-South trade. Okay, you will see opportunities for Brazilian, South African, Indian, Chinese companies to start trading within our markets. You're going to see a greater opportunity coming up. And you know, you can't break away from the fact that a million Indian kids are turning 18 every month. They're not gonna sit back and say, okay, let's wait for Mr. Trump to decide what happens. They're gonna want jobs, they're gonna want consumption, they're going to want a better way of life. And they have to be provided that. Yeah, come on. Optimism notwithstanding, the combination of a perspective of rising rates, um, slowing or significantly slower growth in China than what we had in the previous decade, um, commodity prices that have recovered somewhat, uh, but not quite there, and the very real possibility that protectionism is on the rise. I would give me room for pause and to say that um, 2007 is a year of uncertainty. Yeah. Um, I think that unquestionably, I share your optimism that over the medium term, one looks at demographics uh, and the sheer potential for rates of return. Uh, emerging markets, I think, offer the, the, the pension funds are in dire need, the pension funds in advanced economies are in dire needs of rates of return, uh, which will come importantly from emerging markets. But I do view the 2017 period as one of, of considerable uh, risks. Even if the mean expectation is reasonably solid, I think, uh, 
there's a very big possible dispersion around that mean. Yeah, Minister Dalton. I agree with with, with Arif's uh, optimism, uh, but in addition to what the professor is saying, is, isn't this whiff about uh, forcing us all to rethink models of growth? So we can have the numbers that we're talking about, but the inclusivity cloud is actually hanging over all of us. Yes. And so my view is that through 1718, uh, 18, the pressure from citizens in different countries for inclusivity, for visible benefits to themselves and change in their lives, to a, redu uh, a detectable reduction in inequality in each of our countries, let alone across the globe, uh, amongst the other factors that are uh, playing themselves out, acts as a, uh, an umbrella under which all of us will be uh, performing our, our different roles. And we would be wise if we are to take a three to five year view to start investing a lot more energy in what an inclusive growth model will start looking, about, uh, looking like. And uh, how certainly in the developing countries, I mean, South Africa, you still have a 25, 26% unemployment, a large number of young people who are out of jobs. That applies to the rest of the African continent as well. Our education and training systems need improvement, although they've done remarkably well uh, for a uh, young democracy like ours. But that story is, is a storyline that spreads across most uh, emerging and developing countries as well. But it also, as we've seen through Brexit and uh, the American elections, but the soon to come European elections as well, that citizens are getting a bit fed up. By the way, uh, uh, with, with uh, whatever form they experience marginalization as, both economic and, and social. And uh, leadership, uh, whether you're in business, NGOs, or in government, or academia, is about being two steps ahead, uh, <coughs> black spawns or yeah. not. And especially in our markets, right? Yes. And, and, and we've got to invest uh, energy, resources, and intellectual capability uh, in at least preparing for this future that we all call inclusive, but don't quite have a handle on what the particularities of, of that actually mean. Yeah, thank you. Asani? I completely agree with the minister, and I think um, the uncertainties are around the usual things. If you remember exactly a year ago when we were at the World Economic <laughs> Forum, I think people thought one of the biggest risks is going to be emerging markets, and within that, China. Mm. Yeah. And it was really interesting how things turned out to be very different. And if we take out the period uh, post the Trump uh, 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 election, in, uh, emerging markets were the best markets. So I think uncertainty this year, completely agreed, is going to be even more than last year this time. But I think added to that is this cognizance <laughs> that we do need to look at a different model for growth. And that while uh, the growth over the last 20 years in growth economies has allowed billions of people to get out of poverty and join in with the uh, rest of the population in the world, that same movement has also created biggest dispersion within populations. So now within populations that can compare themselves to each other, you have a bigger amount of disparity, which is what a lot of the studies have been showing. And technology, of course, uh, it's another big topic of, uh, of the World Economic Forum this year, is going to be a huge, huge uh, differentiator between the growth economies, those who are going to be early adapters and those who are going to get impacted, and the economies uh, that were very much built towards just manufacturing. Um, and uh, low levels of labor input could, over the next uh, five to 10 years, get hugely impacted. So I think we're moving into a very different period where technology, which has two aspects, one is access to, um, to information, and two is uh, robotics and, uh, and AI, and how those impact employment will be decision, the, the, the real decision makers. Yeah. 
And the, uh, before we uh, um, uh, go deeper about the technology and other related issues, let's talk a little bit about China. Because uh, all of you mentioned China, and I think uh, uh, Professor Liu will have the privilege to talk about China because uh, uh, the President Xi Jinping uh, told the uh, whole world that China is going to grow at 6.7% uh, this year. And also the IMF has just uh, uh, upgraded the, uh, uh, the growth prospect of China uh, in 2017 and 2018. So, uh, Professor Liu, how would you look at the, uh, uh, China? Do you think China can maintain the, uh, this good momentum in 2017 and 18? Yes, I, 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 yes, I do. Uh, the, I totally agree with what our President Xi mentioned this morning. Because I do not care the speed China could reach, you know, 7 or 6%. It doesn't matter much. The, the, the key issue is the quality of the Chinese development. So we got to take care of that point. That is a key to success for a large country with a large population and facing headwinds and tailwinds in, in globally this year. So uh, what we see is that the, the, the strong points of China is that Chinese government nowadays is well focused upon our shortcomings in our economic development. So it's overcapacity, yeah. and the leverage ratio is too high, especially in the corporate side and the local governments. And also, if you check the inventory, and the banks loan the money too much, much too much in the inventories, the stock is over there, and there's a demand. So that is, that is the way, so with the government, uh, have detailed uh, planning to destocking, deleveraging, yeah. I think and, the, uh, the, uh, the and the reduce of the overcapacity. So yeah. I think the quality will be improved in yeah. China this year and next year. And also, China is very careful, is, is very carefully pushing its monetary policy plus fiscal policies, and they fully understood uh, the tools in the toolkit, yes, we do have some, but it can only buy time. Buy time for what? Buy time for real and the deep solar structural reform. So that is something, it's a very difficult issue in the mission ahead, but uh, we have to do that. It's a must, like SOE reform, yeah. like uh, the, how we can build up the rule of law to protect the property rights, especially intellectual property rights from the private sectors and foreign investment companies and to protect their interests and how we can enhance our transparency, better our communication skills to get, deliver the messages and let ourselves more works acceptable by the whole world. Yeah. So, all, uh, it, it, all these things, we need time. So we use the monetary policy and the fiscal policy only by time. This is not the goal. Any country, if you rely upon fiscal policy and monetary policy to cure your, your, your disease or sicknesses, no way. So the key yeah. is the structural reform. Yeah, but, so coming yeah. back to the point, yeah. I'm not so optimistic talking about the straining US dollars, the negative impact upon the newly emerging markets. Two caveats I got to add on. Every asset in today's world, just like 10 years ago, they're heavily interconnected and interlocking with each other. Yes. Still, they are, okay? And the people working in the market with heavy regulations coming from Basel and from everywhere, yes, we can see uh, conspicuous improvement in terms of fundamentals. But bigger people working in that areas always have very short memories, okay? Yeah. And uh, the rating agencies are yeah. always far away behind the curve. Yeah, it, it's, right. it, it's so, right. so if, if 
the US dollar is strengthened like this way. How far it can go? It can go very far. In my eyes, if the checks and balances domestically facing Trump is less, then what happened? History never repeats itself, but it often rhymes. We still remember the vividly. In 1994 to 1995, when the rate hikes seven times, 25, 50, 75, 50, 75 basis points, then it triggered off the crisis in Mexico. Yeah. One year later, for in less than two years, Asian financial crisis broke out. And another time, it's year 2004 to year 2006, from June to June. In two years, Alan Scram said, OK, I will learn the lessons from last time. I will only move with small, tiny steps forward, each time 25 basis points. How many times? 17 times in running. So the, they, uh, uh, the, the main, it, it the triggered main off lesson. the whole global yeah. financial crisis. Yeah, so the main lesson here is that the emerging okay. market's currency will be affected by the, uh, the no, dollar. No, no, no. And not also only that, currency let's, issue. Yeah, let's talk about the currency little. issue. Okay. Actually, <laughs> is not currency issue proper. Yeah, it's a game of confidence. Uh, yeah, I, so I know. Country Professor Liu Mingkang needs a uh, country uh, the whole hour in, to, to in, in your emerging markets. Let that. me complete that. Yeah, but before that, let's talk a little bit on the on the yuan on the right. RMB. So and also, not to uh, be realistic. Yeah, can I uh, ask you uh, another question about the uh, RMB? Because we know that the uh, the yuan has a, uh, depreciated about six percent last year. Yes. And also, uh, there's a lot of debate on the, uh, uh, the Manipulations Chinese. of Chinese currency, um, right? Maybe yes or maybe no. So uh, <laughs> how do you look at the... Uh, the So-called. Yeah. So would, do you think that the army should be labeled as the uh, currency manipulator? No. Of course not. The reason why, because uh, since we entered the SDR basket in IMF, the PBOC successfully launched the formula or the foreign change rate and nourishment. So we have the bidding and offer system, and the, then the foreign day when we open the market with the formula, and the plus the three baskets for small and the tiny adjustments, OK? So it's, a, it's still a management floating system. So we never manipulate that. And we, we, we couldn't do that. You know, nobody can do that, okay? To manipulate uh, your currency and keep it stable as, for, at first, first thing first, have you any target of your currency? No. You can never have a scientific talk in your mind, the central bank saying that, that is what we need, okay? And yeah. the second, can you hold? That means you got, you got to have the big cushion. Yeah. So the foreign change reserve, we lost almost 900 billion US dollars within, so you, within, you think within that 30 it's very, months. It's very difficult to maintain the no, stability no, no, no. Yes, of the US. Yes. So a common, you have- So I don't RMB think too. it's a manipulation of the currency and it's China- It's a fixed exchange rate or a semi-fixed. So yeah. it, it, unfortunately, I think the term manipulation yeah. has been used loosely. Uh, if what China, had, if you look at historical precedent, there's many. It had a fixed exchange rate for an extended period of time. Now it's moved to a semi-fixed. But what concerns me about the Chinese exchange rate right now is not so much currency manipulation. It's about the inconsistency of monetary policy. You have a classical, you need or you want expansive monetary policy to stimulate the economy, for the corporates to have credit, but you need tighter policy to avoid the depreciation that is too rapid. No, 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 we have only three missions. Uh, the first so so that, tension, yes. that tension between having a central bank that acts of lender of, of last resort and helps in the provision of credit and maintaining a semi-fixed exchange rate, that usually, historically at least, has ended with 
letting the exchange rate go and letting the domestic objective of uh, credit provision and helping the banks win the day. So that leads me to the conclusion that I think uh, substantial depreciation in the renminbi uh, may very well still underway, irrespective of who is president in the United States, uh, because the, the, the pace at which China has been losing reserves is something that cannot be sterilized. You cannot continue to act as Ch uh, China. This last conversation has proved my hypothesis that China should be looked at in isolation from emerging countries. <laughs> 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 so, do you China, agree? Um, yeah. We have no motives, and it's not necessary for us to use depreciated currency to boost our exports. Of course, Chinese so, yeah. exports. The, we, the key issue is the quality of our exports and the competitive advantages. So that is something we stick to. And uh, second, uh, you, you can never tell the central banks everywhere, you, you got to kill three birds with one stone, okay? So we keep the autonomy of our monetary policy at first. And second, we got to stabilize the economy as usual. And uh, then you got to think about, if possible, you open your capital account and let your currency internationalization, internationalized. So we will, to certain degrees, to enhance capital controls and uh, to slow down a little bit about internationalization of the member. Yeah, but to maintain the first goal and the second yeah, goal. Asani? I was going to say that sort of is a really big issue because, um, first of all, the issue of Chinese currency has been on the agenda of the U.S. Treasury, what, since Secretary Rubin and then Larry Summers, and, you know, so it's not a new subject uh, of dialogue between, uh, between the two countries. Um, I remember going to China um, multiple times and talking to the leadership, and I think um, the issue of, um, of uh, currency and how it's viewed um, has been very much on everyone's minds. Uh, but I think I agree with really everything that has been said because China really does have multiple objectives. So for example, the fact that it, the Chinese currency is not part of the SDR um, has had some impact. The fact that maybe China may want or may not want Chinese uh, renminbi to become a reserve currency over the long time uh, will have some impact on this. Um, the fact that, as uh, Professor Reinhardt mentioned, the fact that there have been these huge outflows of, um, uh, of uh, renminbi and of uh, Chinese people who are investing in abroad, but also taking their assets abroad, um, and the fact that the uh, central bank has had to intervene so many times and use up its reserves has had a major impact on that huge uh, huge size of the reserves. Um, and last but not least, we've talked about the uncertainties, particularly this year. Um, exports um, from China uh, will be impacted by, uh, by so many different factors, and imports into China will be impacted by so many factors. But frankly, the, the euro has depreciated by a lot over the last few years, almost 25% uh, of its value. The British pound has, um, has uh, depreciated. So it's not Chinese currency versus US dollar, but it's really across all these other countries and other growth economies that we should look at. And I think while uh, Chinese leadership may have certain views of what they would like the renminbi to do. They may not have all the control elements to control it. And so it will be an interesting thing to watch. Yeah, so the minister, uh, you know a lot about China. So what is your suggestion for, for China to, to deal with the uh, currency issue? Because they, uh, according to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, central parity uh, decide, uh, deciding uh, mechanism now, it, when the United States dollar uh, it's going to appreciate, then the, uh, the RMB will tend to be a depreciate. It's, a, it's kind of a, a decision-making process. It's a market a mechanism. But the, uh, China needs to maintain the uh, RMB a little bit stay, uh, stable, because they, when they, uh, the RMB continue to depreciate, the confidence will be lost. So it's kind of dilemma for the, uh, the policymaker in China. What, what, what is your suggestion for them? 
And I'm in no position to make any suggestion to China. <laughs> They're in a separate bucket, as was uh, explained earlier on. But what we can say is that uh, over the last five or six years, uh, there, were, there have been two dynamics. The one is uh, China attempting, and quite successfully now with the achievement of uh, the inclusion of their currency in the SDR, to become uh, a global currency, let's put it that way. And the next ambition, clearly, uh, as their economy overtakes the U.S., is whether it could become either a parallel or sole reserve currency uh, five, ten years uh, from now. Uh, so that, that's, that's the one dynamic. The other is that uh, since the Great Recession, the, the, the issue of currency, currency wars, have, all, have often been linked to geopolitical factors. And I think, again, if we look at this contextually, it's not just a technical issue that, that we're talking about. It's about who has what influence, uh, what kind of influence. President Xi uh, mentioned today, and that perhaps is the third factor, that we still require reform of the global governance institutions, whether it be their financial institutions or otherwise. And that generally, emerging markets and uh, uh, developing countries have a minimal voice. Uh, what we've seen, although the last three or four years, is that the bigger uh, emerging markets have a lot more leverage uh, in, in some of these institutions. And then the middle-income countries like ourselves are watching patiently, uh, but in an interested way, to see how these dynamics play themselves out. Because what it does is to then create the bucket phenomenon, uh, which is that the, within, within this growth market scenario, you have the bigger economies separating themselves from the smaller economies. And that, I think, creates its own dynamics as well, uh, because all of us want to grow. All of us want uh, some stability uh, in, in the globe. And all of us want to be competitive uh, in, in this environment as well. So if there's any uh, advice or recommendation, it is that China, uh, as the president said today, uh, needs to remain a champion of the emerging markets uh, and ensure that in the global fora, uh, its voice is not a voice for itself, but it's also a voice for the emerging and developing countries so that they can have greater influence over some of these decisions. Uh, but finally, we've got to make uh, global governance work. And uh, it worked well from 2009 to about 2013 or so uh, through the G20. It's fallen into a deficit situation more recently. And uh, one of our concerns should be uh, in a year of uncertainty, which could lead into many more years of uncertainty, uh, where are we going to get the cohesiveness that is required at a leadership level? How are we going to get concerted action as we got in 2009 onwards, uh, globally speaking as well, to create a better growth environment and to capitalize on the kind of contribution that emerging markets are making to global growth as well uh, within that kind of context? So that remains... Uh, I think an important imponderable uh, that, that we've got to continue to look at. And the prospects are gloomy uh, if one looks at the environment today, because geopolitics has become an important factor, far more important today than even three years ago uh, in, in some of these fora, and therefore much more difficult to get uh, coherent and, and united action from amongst the diversity of countries that are represented in many of these fora as well. Yeah, I think it's now time for us to open the floor to uh, receive questions from our uh, uh, audience. Uh, uh, please I identify who you are and the, uh, uh, if you have any, any questions, please go ahead. No question? No comments. Yeah, so we'll go back to, to our uh, panel discussion. Yeah, please. Uh, on the China, this uh, red flag uh, on the pollution and uh, very strict uh, rules to control uh, the environmental side, what is moving very strong uh, in our view, how do you see that can impact the growth of uh, China or what uh, you expect to become in the next uh, months or years? That's a good question, yes. And China uh, noticed this is a serious issue. So we, we hand in hand with the US and many other countries, we signed the Paris Agreement. 
So we, we will be firmly abide by the agreement and we set our goals and to the fight against the pollutions, not only in the air, but in the water and in the earth and many others. So uh, this overall planning to reduce the emissions and starting from this year, China will wage a new mechanism that's a carbon exchange uh, system and use the market mechanism to use the cap system and uh, then people can trade and you got to pay something for extra emissions. And uh, I think uh, <coughs> in the near future, uh, the, every province and every like state in this large country we have their specific goals to reduce the you know, pollution and industries. And we have achieved uh, a lot of things. And the first thing is that, first of its kind in China history, we have specific goals. That means we got to reduce one billion tons of coal mining capacity. And also we got to reduce 200 million tons steel every year. That's the capacity. Then we longer the list, and uh, including the glass making, shipbuilding, and uh, chemical industries and the power industries as well. So that will be uh, the list will be longer and longer in in the future. Uh, so we have set up the goals, and uh, fortunately, the sense of the rebalance our economy is uh, stronger. And uh, more and the more people will have, uh, you know, have their benchmark much higher. And uh, so that philosophy and the yardsticks will be applied in the projects we are going to take along the Belt and Road as well. Yeah, thank you, Asani. I was going to add, and as you well know, uh, China is spending over 100 billion a year over the next few years. So that's the largest investment. India, by comparison, is trying to also increase. And that's only like in the tens of billions versus the hundred uh, billion that uh, China is talking about. And I think just like with technology, clean energy uh, will be a differentiator among uh, the growth economies. Um, so that's gives both uh, an impetus to growth, uh, a differentiator, and really a way um, that China will also employ. I think the employment impact in China will be about 13 million people a year. So this will be very huge. And I think the other interesting thing in the context of what we discussed also is there has been a lot of discussion in the US about increasing coal production and uh, putting coal workers back to work. The question is who's going to buy that coal, because mm -hmm. as we heard, China will not be buying that new additional coal. And, um, and in the US, there's a lot of um, emissions controls, and uh, probably that coal will not mm -hmm. get sold there. So question mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I think the gentleman there uh, has a question. It seems to me that uh, uh, Mr. Trump has one objective that is not talked about here, which is to fight extremism uh, uh, in, the, in the world. And by fighting extremism, there is going to be a backlash among those extremists. And, and that could manifest itself in terrorists' activities. Uh, how much of that represents a headwind for, global, for the global economy? So, Atif? So, you know, I think what the minister referred to earlier about geopolitics playing a much bigger role today than it ever has done before <laughs> is really at the heart of the question that you're asking because terrorism and all its manifestations are a function of a small group of extremely disgruntled and marginalized people expressing their will on the rest of us. So is it going to go away anytime soon? I think that until we start looking at more collaborative systems, it's not going to go away. And so this is a reality that's come to stay. And you know, in the last 30 years, we went from a bipolar world in which we had Russia and the US into a, into a unipolar world, into a multipolar world. And now we're in a world where non-state actors are beginning to operate and define a large element of how the global agenda is either hindered, hijacked, or uh, enabled to grow. It's not going to go away anytime soon. I think we need to uh, take a fresh look 
it's not my expertise or I don't think it's anybody here's expertise to talk about security issues, but I think that um, it is going to impact growth, certainly in some markets, but it goes back to my original hypothesis that you can't look at all of these markets as one umbrella. You have to break it down, you have to bifurcate, and unfortunately, there are large areas within the Middle East which are impossible to invest in or focus on delivering development into whilst they remain subject to uh, either terrorist activity or non-state act uh, action. But there are other parts of the world, which is why we came here. We came here to talk about global growth markets, and we came here to talk about the opportunity that is inherent in those markets. And we talked about the optimism, and then we talked a lot about um, a single state, which is China. But you know, Asane <laughs> touched upon, and the minister touched upon a very important point which is technology and the enabling role of technology. And I think that, you know, I know that you asked a specific question and I'm now going into a different area. But I do feel it's important for this audience to hear and understand that the biggest beneficiaries of technological change that is happening in Silicon Valley and elsewhere in the world are actually these emerging markets because they don't have the baggage of multiple systems and generations of technology before. They're starting from a clean slate. Africa's gone from 1G to 4G. And what that means is if you stop for a second and think, 80% of the average household's income is spent either in education, healthcare, food, and housing, 80%. Today's technology and today's technologi technological disruption could well bring that number down to 50%, 40%. Imagine the enormous amount of household consumption that is going to be released and income is going to be allowed to spend on so many other activities, lifestyles, and attitudes will change. So optimist, optimist number one, and without any hesitation, with the disruption caused by terrorist action, with the nonsense caused by manipulation of either currencies or interest rate hikes, with all the negativity you can throw at it, the reality is profound, which is the consumer is king, and the consumer will drive opportunity in these markets in a fairly unrestricted basis over the course of the next decade. Yeah, so I think that we start with the uh, uh, optimism, then we turn a little bit pessimistic a little bit, then we move back to the optimism. So it's the, <laughs> it's the uh, best time for us to, to wrap up. <laughs> and so I would like to wrap up by asking the uh, panelists uh, a final question. Uh, where is the opportunities, in your view, in the global uh, growth market, and how could policymakers see these uh, opportunities? Uh, so uh, Professor Reinhardt? I'm going to talk about a risk. <laughs> uh, I, Opportunities. I, I, and this is related to the last question. I, I think one type of risk we really haven't addressed in this panel is we hear a lot about the return of populism and the advanced economies. We've seen Brexit. We've seen uh, the, the, the presidential election in the United States. Uh, and we are concerned about the forthcoming elections in Europe potentially yeah. yielding. Uh, uh, By the way, do you think uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel will win? And will uh, Lady uh, Le Pen no, will the, win? No, the, the, the point that I'm making is that in an environment in which populism is on the rise in advanced economies, we really haven't touched about the possibility that this could be a contagious phenomenon. Uh, and that some of the political risks that emerging markets face, especially in the worst scenario in which trade barriers and the like uh, win the day, uh, would be uh, moving away from uh, open market economies to uh, retrenching into uh, populism and retrenching into policy reversals. I bring this up because during the 1980s, which was a very tough decade for many emerging markets, uh, we saw a lot of policy reversals. So the counterpart to the question you posed to me is, what should policymakers avoid? Yeah. Uh, or what should investors be concerned about? And that would be policy reversals. Yeah, thank you. Atif? So, opportunities very quickly. So, so exactly what you refer to as a risk is, I think, an opportunity. And I think it's very important <laughs> to realize that the same populism that you refer to as a risk 
I see it as an opportunity and a clarion call mm -hmm. for governments in emerging markets to respect the fact that people, populations, <coughs> are beginning to manifest their views in a very coherent manner, and they need to reform their systems in order to get more and more people on side with them. There are many countries in our markets which are very singular uh, party driven, that are very uh, dogmatic in their views. This is the opportunity, this is the year for all of that to change and more inclusion to be developed and evolved. And in that I agree with the minister completely that this is for the first time on a global basis an opportunity for all of us to look for a better outcome. Yeah, thank you. Professor Liu, uh, opportunities? Yes. Uh, opportunities uh, as a conspicuous. The first thing is that if you look at the business fundamentals of the global growth markets, they're much, much better than before uh, in year 2007 and year 2008. It's different. Yeah. And uh, regulation is better, um, perhaps. <laughs> and uh, fossil free is helpful mm -hmm. and uh, also we have a lot of, uh, you know, stabilizations, the cushions to do that, like the creation of cocos, the debentures could be converted into capital in the market. It, yeah. it, such a thing uh, has happened. And uh, AT1 uh, and also the worldwide information change, exchange among the regulators and central bankers are much, much better than, yeah. than before. This is the first thing. The second so opportunity, opportunity is that mm -hmm. uh, definitely the U.S. Mm -hmm. economic growth is a renewed the engine of the growth of the whole world market. So it's and the biggest opportunities. Yes, and yeah. the third is commodity price stability is, is, uh, could be helpful to the uh, export commodity of export countries uh, in, in the global growth markets as well. So a lot of opportunities. So Asani, what is your uh, final I think word? I will uh, just read, uh, I think, the potential of technology and yeah. uh, having uh, more access to the web, which improves education, health, and, uh, and jump starts a lot of um, the growth economies in a way um, that they could not have done over the last 10 years could be quite uh, important and really the opportunity to, as they are growing so fast and improving their infrastructure, to, uh, to invest in, in clean and sustainable um, investments in those areas. So those two areas, I think, would be very important and very exciting. Yeah, thank you. Minister Gautam. Three things. I think the, the growth markets, as we call them today, are humanity's future. They're the future in terms of helping first world pension funds, for example, to get better returns, uh, to actually solve some of the food related, the food security problems, and there's a whole list uh, in relation to them. So the greater the opportunity to recognize that we are living in an integrated world, notwithstanding the current phase of protectionism. The second is investing energy in this inclusive uh, growth model, so that we move the center of gravity of this debate to inclusion of citizens, greater respect for them, and benefits being directly attributed to them. And then uh, areas like infra infrastructure, sustainable development, and uh, developing human beings uh, through better health systems, education systems, with the use of technology, uh, so that uh, these countries can move up the value chain as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Please join me with a big applaud for thanking our uh, great panelists. Thank you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the uh, winter doubles. Thank you.